Well, praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I first want to welcome our guest, Charles, today. One of my favorite cousins. He came to be with us with Jimbo. Crosswell Fellowship. Welcome. We only embarrass you once. So. Uh, well, this morning I want to talk about the subject of dressing for the fight. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, we are told to put on the armor to win this fight. In Ephesians 6, beginning with verse 12, it reads, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Last week, I said that we are to take the enemy seriously. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have been guilty in the past of making light of the enemy. You know, calling him a wimp and things of that nature. But, but the more I think about it, the more I realize he is a forceful opponent. And we really do need to take him seriously. Unfortunately, there are many people who do not even believe there's an enemy. Do not even give a, give a second thought that there's a battle at hand. But we need to take him seriously. Uh, a lot of times, it's easy to make light of the enemy when you're not in the middle of a fight. Amen? But if you've been in a fight, you recognize that there is a formidable enemy that we have to contend with. And his name is Satan, Lucifer, the devil. And as I mentioned last week, you probably will not actually encounter the audience of the devil himself. Because the devil is not like God. The devil is not omnipresent. The devil cannot be everywhere at the same time like God is. The devil is not all-powerful. The devil is not omniscient. He, he's not all-knowing. You know how he finds things out? is by what you speak out of your mouth. That's where he, he learns where you are. That's why we have to be careful what we say. Because what we say kind of activates uh, the demonic realm. No, we do not necessarily have an encounter with the devil. But we have an encounter with demons. Yes. Believers are in a daily battle with the enemy. And the enemy is determined to stop you from reaching your destiny in Christ. He's, just, he's determined to stop you from accomplishing the goals that God has set before you to accomplish. Have you ever noticed that as soon as you say, I'm going to start doing this, and it's something for God that all of a sudden, all hell literally breaks out in your life. Anybody ever been there? You make a decision to be more committed. You make a decision to, to walk uh, closer to God or, or to do something for Him. And all of a sudden, there's this resistance that seems to happen. You know, I'm going to spend some time in prayer today. And all of a sudden, the phone rings like it never rang before. And, and different things begin to happen that, that are out of the norm because the enemy is at work trying to stop you from reaching your God-given goals. We're in a daily battle. And his weapons are fear, intimidation, lying, and deceit. He aims to cause you to doubt God. He, he tries his best to get you to doubt God's Word. He tried this with Eve. And unfortunately, for all of us, he succeeded. God, he, 
has God said? Remember that? And the famous question. Has God said? He put that question mark in her mind. Has God said in Genesis 3, verse 1, it reads, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? How many times has he said that to you? Has God said? Is that really true? What God's Word says. After all, it doesn't really look like it's working. He tried the same thing with Jesus when He was in the wilderness. With Jesus, He tried to get Him to doubt who He was. In Luke 4, 3, And the devil said to Him, If, everybody say if. 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 I mean, that's a giant if. He says, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. He says to you, you say you're an overcomer. You say you're more than a conqueror. You say God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. Really? How's that working for you? Many times, He would try to get us to doubt. And as soon as we begin to doubt, we step out of the realm that God wants us to be placed in. Many times, what happens is, when the enemy begins to speak that word into your mind, you start agreeing with him. Yeah, that's right. Just like Eve began to agree with him. Well, maybe I could do this. And we say, well, maybe that isn't true. And as soon as we quit believing what God says in his word, then we are setting ourselves up to be a victim of the enemy. We have two examples before us. One leads to death and the other leads to life. Because of Eve's actions and ultimately Adam's actions, death came. But through the action of Jesus, we are offered life. Amen? Amen. Jesus responded to the enemy when he said, If you are the Son of God... How did he respond? He responded by declaring and standing on the Word of God. And church, that's what we have to do. When the enemy comes and lies to us and tries to get us to doubt, tries to intimidate us, tries to get us to walk in fear, we need to declare the Word of God and stand on the Word of God. It is written. Jesus answered him saying, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And church, that's the example we need to follow. Don't follow Eve's example and start agreeing with the enemy, but start following the example Jesus gave and, and say, it is written. And know the word of God. That's why it's so important to understand the word of God. I tell you, church, we cannot fight properly if we do not know the word of God because the word of God is our sword. And that would be like going to a sword fight without a sword. I don't think we want to be there, do we? Matter of fact, in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it reads there, part of that says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed. My people perish because of a lack of knowledge. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we're reminded of what we talked about last week. It reads, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Again, we're it's saying here, take the enemy seriously. Get prepared for this fight. You know, sometimes a, a ball game, a, 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 a better opponent may be playing a lesser opponent, but because they think they can just go in there and win without preparing, they end up losing sometimes, amen? And that's why we have to be careful about the enemy. We, we just can't go in unprepared. We must be prepared. We must fill our heart and our spirit and our mind with the Word of God so that when He comes to tempt, when He comes to lie, when He comes to, to uh, uh, try to strike fear in us, we can stand up and boldly say, Devil, I know you're a liar. It is written. And claim your promise. Declare what the Word of God says on your behalf. Believers that are biblically illiterate are easy prey for the enemy. 
You know, I talk a lot about getting the Word of God in your heart, reading the Bible, making the Word of God part of your life. I don't say that to tell you to do a religious exercise. Oh, good, I read my three chapters today. I can check that off. I did my religious duty. No, I'm telling you that because it's important to get the Word of God in you. That's your weapon. That is, uh, that, that is your sword in the fight. Amen? Hallelujah. We must hide God's Word in our heart. That way when the devil comes to tempt us, we can answer back with faith and assurance it is written. The enemy is also at work in the local church. He tries to bring division among the believers. And, and this has ruined many churches. Division, and I tell you, you know when division normally starts? is when, when the church begins to excel in, in the call of God. It's whenever they begin to take flight. The enemy recognizes that. The enemy comes in and he tries to, to, to strike division, you know, co uh, divide and conquer. And, and that's why you always have to be so careful. I thank God for the unity that Crosswalk Fellowship has. But always have your guard up. Not to let him use you as a pawn in his plan, in his scheme, in employees. Matter of fact, Titus 3.10 says, Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. admonition. Now this doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything. But when it's obvious that a person's objective is to cause division, you can count on it, the enemy is at work in that person. Another way the enemy is at work, by stirring up confusion, by inserting false doctrine. And I see the enemy at work, and I know I've talked about this on several occasions, but church, this is what's happening today. False doctrine infiltrating the church. He's sneaky on how he does it. He'll take uh, uh, what is good, what is, what is a truth, and he'll slant it, he'll tilt it to where it's no longer a truth. Today, grace is the truth. <coughs> that the enemy is perverting. Some have stretched grace to mean that sin doesn't matter. And others have gone so far as to say sin really does not exist. I mean, it, unless you believe it's sin, it's not sin. That's being taught in a lot of churches today. It's all in your mind. If you believe it's sin, it's sin. But if you don't believe it's sin, then it's not sin. So you should not be sin conscious. Now, I don't think we need to dwell on sin all the time, but we cannot deny the fact that sin is sin. Did I already say that some say that, yes, some say it doesn't exist. They also go on to say that hell is not real. They say no one is going to hell because of God's grace. No, God's grace provides a way of escape from a literal place called hell. But many will still go there because they reject God's grace. And my word to you and my word to everyone is this. Do not neglect the grace of God. Matter of fact, in Hebrews it says, how shall we escape if we neglect such great grace, amen, or a great salvation? Well, the answer to that is you won't. If you neglect His salvation, you will not escape. The only way to escape is by accepting His great salvation. And these are, are just a few of the ways the enemy will attack us as individuals, as a local church, and as the church as a whole. So we're told to put on the whole armor we do not want any part of our lives exposed to the enemy. We want to cover up with his armor. I've heard it said before that if you have the whole armor of God on, the only place exposed is your back. Therefore, that's why we should never run from a fight. Amen? It says when you've done all the stand, stand. Amen? But we're not to turn and run. We must face the enemy head on. Calling 
reinforcements. Amen. That's what corporate prayer is about. When we come together here on Sunday mornings and worship and pray, that's part of your fight. Amen. If you're in a fight, you can say, hey, would you join me? Would you agree with me? I'm believing for this to take place. The enemy's been at it. Well, greater is he that is in you. And I tell you, uh, with, if uh, uh, one can put a thousand of life, how many can all of us put a life? Amen. In Ephesians 6, verses 13 and 14, it reads there, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and have you done all to stand? Have you done all? Have, have you put on the armor? We're going to be talking about the armor a little bit today and finishing up next Sunday. But have you put on the whole armor? You say, yes, Pastor. I put on the armor. Then what do I do? Then you stand. Have you done all? What? Put all the armor on. Stand. Stand there for it. Just stand your ground. Stand on the promises of God. And, and stand upon His Word and say, it is written. Having done all to stand, stand there for Open. When, you see, if you run, you open yourself up to the fiery darts of the enemy. Your back is exposed. Stand your ground. Having done all. First thing I want to talk about this morning in the armor. And there's so much you can say about each one of these, but uh, the series that I'm, I'm trying to, to develop and share with you is called uh, a sure foundation. And that's how I wanted to begin this year off, talking about our foundation in Christ and on His Word. So I can't spend 10 weeks on the armor. We could, but I want it's going to take a long time just to get through the series that I'm working on. But what, the part I want to talk to you about today is a couple uh, pieces of armor. And the first one is the belt of truth. Now the belt of truth is a defensive weapon. It says, having girded your waist with truth. Now this is talking about the truth of God. Jesus is the truth of God. Amen. He said He was. He said, I am the truth. Amen. I am the life. I am the way. Jesus is the truth. And God's Word is the truth. We must believe that. And there's plenty to back it up. That the Word of God is His truth. Then on the other side, if Jesus is the truth, and His Word is the truth. Satan is a liar. And His Word is a lie. How do you know the devil's lying? Amen. He opened his mouth. Amen. <laughs> all truth comes from God. All lies come from Satan. But there are many today that have been deceived by the deceiver. They believe the false doctrine. That in most cases, the doctrines that are rising up today are no more than New Age thinking. When this was written about putting on the belt of truth or having girded your waist with truth, men wore long robes at that time. And when it talks about girding up with the belt of truth, what they would do is they'd gather up those robes, those garments, and then they would take, pull them up between their legs like this and tuck them into this big leather belt. And it kind of made like pants out of them. That way they can move freely. Today, if you know, if I'm getting ready to get in a fight, what am I going to do? I'm going to roll my sleeves up and get ready to fight. Amen? You know, that way you don't hinder your arms. Well, what they're saying there is gird up with truth so it doesn't hinder your fight. Amen? It, it, it makes you uh, where you can move better. You can run toward the enemy if you need to. Amen? So we're told, girding up your, your waist with truth. So, uh, if, uh, we're, we're to be ready to fight. We don't want to be hindered uh, by anything that the enemy brings at us. We don't want to be hindered by his lies, which are what? Fear. His lies are confusion. His lies are doubt. When the enemy hits us with a lie, we're to do like Jesus did and hit him back with the truth of the Word of God. It is what? Written. Written. It is written. And after we put on the belt of truth, it tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. It reads, and having, done, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate protects the vital organs. When the Roman soldier would put on this breastplate, it would protect him 
from his neck all the way down to his thigh area. And it would protect all these vital or organs. It would protect him uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It would also protect him from the, the, the arrows that the enemy might fire away at him. Uh, so keeping this in mind, again, retreat is not an option. Amen? Because if you turn, you don't have it on the back side. Everything is made to advance, not to retreat. When we talk about righteousness, what does that really mean? Righteousness means right standing. Because of what Christ has done for us, we now have right standing with God. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now here's the good news, church. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. I mean, that's mind-boggling in itself, isn't it? Jesus, the Holy One, the Son of God. He, you know, he, well, the one who did not sin became sin. Why? Because He took our sin upon Him and bore it on a tree. In other words, He took the sin of the world, all sin, we think of the physical pain that He went through. I don't believe as bad as that was and as horrible and horrendous as that was, we cannot even imagine. It says they beat Him to the point He did not even look like a human. Now, that is awful. Words cannot describe. But as awful as that is, can you imagine taking the weight of the sin of the world, the guilt, the shame, everything that everyone has gone through, and He has taken that upon Himself and He bore it on a tree to pay the price for our sin. But He became sin that we who do know righteousness, it tells us that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We who do know righteousness are now righteous because of what He did for us. We now stand before God holy, blameless, and in love because of what He's done for us. You see, we cannot be righteous by mere effort. That's religion. Our trying to be good enough to be accepted by God. No, God loved us while we were sinners, enemies, haters of Him. He loved us and gave His only Son to die upon the cross. Amen? We are righteous because we receive the gift of salvation. We're righteous because we've received the gift of righteousness that He offered us. Now we need to understand this. Once we receive that gift of righteousness, now we need to live that way. Amen? He's enabled us to live that way. Now we need to begin to follow Him and, and act or, or be like Him. He empowers us by the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work in our lives. Jesus said, Be holy as I am holy. We're being conformed into the image of Christ. Yes, Pastor, but that takes discipline. Yes, it does. Discipline. What is discipline? Self-control. Amen? Self-control. And guess what self-control is? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? And as we spend time with Him and allow His Word and, uh, to enter into our hearts and as we uh, 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 get into His presence, that begins to bring a change in our lives. That begins to bring self-control. Well, I just can't help it within the Word of God's not true. After all, I'm human. What's that mean? It's not your effort, amen? It's He who empowers you to overcome. You know, if we're not growing in Christ, we ought to be concerned about it. If we're no more like Christ this year than we were last year, we need to check ourselves and see why. Because we're called to grow in Him. We're called to be conformed into His image. You know, I get tired of hearing, well, you know, it really doesn't matter if I sin. After all, I'm under grace. It does matter because the Word of God says it matters. 
It amazes me how a little league baseball team requires more discipline out of themselves than a Christian does. Have one person say amen, huh? <laughs> now I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about doing what God's Word tells us to do. Thank God we do not depend upon our righteousness for salvation. But let's not be lazy believers. Let's apply God's Word to our lives. And church, when we apply God's Word to our lives, then we can truly live in victory. You know why we want to overcome sin? Because sin brings bondage. See, anybody here want to be bound? Then we need to learn to overcome the sin that the enemy tries to bring in our lives. And when we overcome the sin, we overcome the bondage that he tries to bring us into. You know, if a person's bound by drugs, that person is not happy. Jesus came to set us free from that. But you know, if you're bound by gossip, I just can't help myself, you'll be a much happier person when you overcome the sin of gossip. Amen? I mean, you name any sin. You know what one person said about sin? He said, you think how that goes. He said, sin will cost you more than you want to pay take you further than you want to go and make you stay longer than you want to stay. That's why we avoid sin. Amen? Because it comes at a price. But Jesus came that we might be set free from sin. Amen? That we might be overcomers. And He's given us the power to overcome. And we can't overcome if we do not get lazy. Amen? Spend time with the Lord. Spend time in His Word. Ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. And watch yourself get the victory. Amen? We have the victory. You just need to walk in it. We're righteous because of what He did. Now we need to walk in it. Amen? I'm going to close with this. We're told in Ephesians to walk worthy of our vocation. What is our vocation as believers? It's being a believer, amen? We're going to walk worthy of that. Now, we can never walk worthy enough to be a believer, but since He made us righteous, now we need to walk worthy of that. We need to, to walk accordingly. Does that mean we'll never mess up? Probably not. We probably will. But it's kind of like this. I used to say, I'm not a painter, but I paint a room. Well, now I kind of am a painter. But... Uh, so I do that on the side a little bit. But I'm not a mechanic, that's fair to say. But I may change brakes now and then. But that's not who I am. I'm not a mechanic. Tom's a mechanic. I mean, not by profession. Well, he is actually. I mean, he works on machines. And, but he can also work on a car, fix a car, come up with ideas when there seems to be no way to make it work. He can do that kind of thing because he's a mechanic. Well, I'm not. I mean, I can do a little something here and there, but I get stuck pretty quick because I'm not a mechanic. And you know, it goes back to, you know, we all were sinners. But we're not sinners now. We may sin, but now we have been given the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? I am now righteous because of what He did. I may mess up and sin, but that's not my way of life. And it shouldn't be our way of life. Amen? As a believer, sin should not be a way of life. Righteousness should be a way of life. Now, there's times we may mess up, but thank God when we mess up, we can say, Lord, I messed up. I'm sorry. And the Lord just picks us up, dusts us off, and says, all right, buddy, keep moving. You know, Winter will be learning how to walk. My little one-year-old granddaughter will be learning how to walk here pretty soon. And guess what's going to happen? She's going to fall down a few times. Now, do you think mom and dad are going to go, what's wrong with you, kid? Get up. Quit falling down. No, mom and dad are lovingly going to reach down and go, you did good. You took three steps. 
Get up, let's go for six. And before you know it, winter will not be just walking. Winter will be running. So that's the way God is with us. You know, He doesn't want to kick us when we fall down. Well, what's wrong with you? I'm done with you. No. When we mess up, God says, come on, you made it further that time. Let's try again. Get up. I'm right here with you. I'm here to catch you. I'm here to pick you up. You see, that's who our Father is. He wants to help us gain the victory. But we have to at least take those steps. Amen? Yeah. Or else we'll be crawling the rest of our lives. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a 20-year-old person crawling around in the world. With His help, we can all someday run. Amen? And do great exploits for God. Hallelujah. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank You again for Your Word this morning. We thank You for the victory that You've given us and the victory that is ours yet to attain. And we just thank You, Lord, that You have provided a way for us to overcome every obstacle that the enemy might throw in our way. And Lord, I pray as we go through uh, the different aspects of this armor, Lord, that You would speak to us Help us learn, Lord, how to apply your armor and keep it on day by day that we might just gain ground for your kingdom and that we might make a difference in the age to come. And Lord, we're just careful to give you all the praise for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to